Hello everyone, I'm Matthew with the American Heritage Museum and today I'd like to take you on a full tour of our American M1917 light tank. For a little backstory, the six-ton tank model 1917 was America's first mass-produced tank being a licensed copy of the French Renault FT. The Renault FT was revolutionary in tank development, pioneering a lot of features still seen on tanks today like a 360 degree rotating turret carrying the tank's armament and an engine compartment in the rear separate from the crew. Said crew only consisted of a two-man team with a driver in the front and commander gunner up in the turret. The M1917 maintained these major features but made some minor alterations here or there which will be seen as we go along with this tour. After converting the FT's blueprints into imperial measurements the M1917 entered production in October of 1918 with the first two units arriving in France November 20th, nine days after the armistice took effect, marking the end of the First World War. As for our M1917, this vehicle is the 297th tank produced by Van Dorn Iron Works of Cleveland, Ohio, and was manufactured between March 13th and 23rd, 1919. This vehicle is also one of four tanks purchased from the U.S. Army by the M.C. Bradley Military Rental Studios of North Hollywood, which rented out military vehicles for use in films. After which, she changed hands at least once before she was purchased by Jacques Littlefield and stayed at the Military Vehicle Technology Foundation in Portola Valley, California, and today she resides here in Hudson, Massachusetts, on display in our museum as a staple piece of our World War I trench experience. Let's begin our tour at the front of the hull. There isn't much super visually interesting out here, and hogging most of the front glasses is actually the driver's hatches, with this top plate opening upwards and these two doors opening out to the sides. One neat feature in the front here is this set of steps. There's one on either side, and despite their proximity, these don't touch the running gear, and so they're not structural, meaning that they're just here for crew convenience and they do make climbing on the tank and getting in the tank a much easier task. It's worth mentioning that the armor over most of the vehicle is six-tenths of an inch thick. This seemingly odd thickness is likely the effect of the conversion from metric, as 0.6 inch is 15.24 millimeter, which is very similar to the 16 millimeter armor of the original Renault. Speaking of which, right here we have our first obvious departure from the FT. On the Renault, this corner is made from only one piece of metal with only one vision slit. On the M1917, as you can see, the corner was split into two pieces of metal with two vision slits, giving your driver slightly better visibility. Now on the right side of the vehicle, we can see that taking up most of the space here is the running gear. So starting at the front of this assembly, we have our idler wheels. On the Renault FT, these were made of laminated wood with a metal rim, whereas these on the Model 1917 are all metal. Yet another departure from the Renault FT are these compact track tension assemblies, which are different from the larger wishbone-shaped assemblies on the Renault. In addition to the idler wheels, we also have this roller frame to help maintain track tension by applying upwards pressure on the track using this coil spring. Moving down, each side of the M1917 has nine road wheels split between four trucks, which then attach to two leaf spring assemblies in groups of two. This is only half of the vehicle's suspension. In at the back, we have the sprocket wheel, which ties back to the transmission through a rather convoluted system of gears. Something I find rather neat about the Renault FT and M1917 is just how external all the running gear is. The really cool thing with this design, and the reason it sticks out so far from the vehicle, is that this entire assembly moves as part of the suspension. This whole lower frame pivots back here by the sprocket wheel, with the front end tying into that large coil spring, giving this entire frame assembly about three inches of upward movement. With the coil springs softening the shock of impacts and the leaf spring assemblies conforming the wheels to the ground, the M1917 has the ability to elegantly traverse rough terrain. 
The last component we have of the running gear are the tracks. These tracks are very flat with this small cleat ridge. They're about 13 and 3 8 inch wide and it takes a whopping 32 links to make up one side's full track band. And each link on this vehicle is branded with this big AMSCO inscription. If you couldn't guess already, the company AMSCO produced the track links and they were really proud of it. Right here we have a single shovel with another shovel and pickaxe found on the other side and right here we have a very interesting feature, a lifting hook. On the upper edge of the hull we have two lifting hooks, one on either side. These are not seen on the Renault FT and are unique to the M1917 because unlike the French tanks, these vehicles were going to have to cross the Atlantic Ocean to get to the war they planned to fight in. And so these lifting hooks were added to lift the tanks onto ships. The last thing to see on the left side is the muffler. This is different from the muffler on the FT, which is mounted on the right side with this space taken up by a toolbox instead. Now at the rear of the vehicle, we have this square stud down here. This is for manually starting the engine with this hand crank. You would take the crank, mount it onto the stud like so, and then you would manually crank over the engine until it starts. At the time, hand starting an engine like this was very common, especially with automobiles. For example, the Ford Model T uses an incredibly similar system. To see this in action, take it away past me. And lastly, we use the crank handle in the front to start the engine. You see that? He's a natural, it's beautiful. On the topic of starting the vehicle, I should mention as well that an electric starter was tested in one of these. It worked fine, but was ultimately declined due to the increased cost of production that came with it. Right here, we have our manufacturer's data plate. This tells us the ordnance department number of this vehicle, as well as who produced it. In our case, Van Dorn Ironworks of Cleveland, Ohio, as previously stated. And right here, as well as down here, we have the mounting hardware for a trench crossing tail. Another thing to mention while we're back here are these small dents you'll see on a bunch of the armor plates on this vehicle. These are armor tests done by the manufacturer to confirm and more importantly prove that the armor is of proper quality. These tests would be done three times per selected plate, hence the three marks you see here as well as the three marks you see down here. Engine access was made rather easy with these three hatches. These also give the tank a rather unique profile with all three of them open. Like so. Unlike the Renault FT, which had a Renault engine, par for the course, the M1917 is fit with the American Buddha HU four-cylinder L-head or flathead engine. This engine had a power output of 42 horsepower at 1,460 RPM, which got this tank up to an oddly specific top speed of 5.5 miles per hour. Also in here, we can see this massive radiator, and behind that, a flywheel. On top here, we have the fill port for our 30 gallon fuel tank mounted just above the transmission, the fill port for our radiator, and this air intake grate. Below this grate is a fan that pulls air in, pushing that air back through the radiator with that now hot air exhausting out of this vent. The last thing to look at before we go inside this vehicle is the turret. The M1917 is fit with an octagonal turret wielding either a 37mm cannon or, like this one, a 30 caliber machine gun. Around the gun is a gun shield. This is something not seen on the FT, which made it somewhat susceptible to being jammed with shrapnel and bullet fragments. On top of the turret, we have this round cupola with three vision slits, one in front and one on either side, along with this hinging top for both ventilation and visibility, 
And this cover also has a small circular hole in the top of it for using signal flags. On the back here, we have crew entry hatches. And the last thing to see on the turret are these two small loopholes, known today as pistol ports. Supposedly, these were known as loopholes because it is a metaphorical loophole to get around the armor with a gun. Now that we've seen just about everything there is to see outside, let's take a look at the inside. Starting here in the driver's seat, we have three pedals on the floor in front of me, a clutch, gas, and brake pedal. Moving back just slightly, we have these two tillers. These are used for steering the vehicle. Using the left one as an example, by pulling this back just slightly, you disengage drive for the left-hand track using a clutch, beginning a left-hand turn. By pulling this back further, you engage braking force on the left-hand track to make an even sharper turn. And this is variable, so the farther back you pull it, the sharper you'll turn. Moving down to my right, we have the gear shifter for controlling our four-speed gearbox with a small button on top of the handle preventing us from accidentally shifting into reverse gear. Just behind this, we have two small handles. The one on the left is a hand throttle, which is for setting our idle RPM speed, and the handle on the right is our spark advance. This is used for engine timing and controls when in the piston stroke the spark occurs. As the driver, you sit only about six inches off the belly of the tank. And by pulling up this plate under the commander, we can see all the control linkages running from the driver back to the engine and transmission. Right here on the wall, we have our all-encompassing instrument panel. At the top, we have a speedometer that goes up to at least 10 miles per hour, a hole where our oil pressure gauge would go, a hole where our ignition switch would go, and an odometer in both meters and kilometers. It's perfect, you can't ask for more. Last things to talk about up here, we have a toolbox down to the left, and at this seam in the armor, we have mounting studs for a leather backrest, the rightmost of which is missing, leaving only the mounting holes for its bolts. Before we move on, I'd like to take a moment to appreciate the absolute lack of visibility in here. When you're buttoned up, all you have are five tiny vision slits to see out, all of which are just holes in the armor that could allow shrapnel and bullet fragments to fly in. And those are what you have to put your eyes right up to to see anything. Just not an ideal scenario. With the driver's seat covered, let's get in the turret. As the commander, you would be standing in the turret like I am now. Normally, hung from two hooks in here would be a sling that you could sit in. Uh, as we lack an original sling for this vehicle, and instead I have hung a lifting strap, which honestly gets this turret... This turret is more comfortable than it has any right being. To traverse the turret, we grab this handle on the left wall, and while bracing with our feet and our right hand, we simply manhandle this thing until it turns. This does our course aiming, and it gets our gun pointed roughly where we want it, and then we do our fine tuning and our actual aiming with the 9.1 inch diameter ball mount our machine gun is placed in. This ball mount has about 30 degrees of movement horizontally and about 48 degrees of movement vertically. This particular ball mount is roughly 1920s era, so it's not the same style used on the M1917s produced closer to World War I, which is likely why it can fit this World War II era M1919A4 I have mounted for demonstration purposes. Surrounding me in here would somehow be 4200 rounds of 30 6 The racks to store that ammo are missing, unfortunately. 
Behind me, we have the firewall between the engine and the crew. This has two sliding vents, one on either side, allowing you access to the brake drums, and in the center, this housing. This protects your emergency starting controls. Up here we have another square stud for our starting crank handle, and down here we have our engagement plunger. If your engine stalls in combat, which wasn't uncommon during World War I, you need a safe way to start the engine from the interior, which is what this assembly is for. You simply depress this plunger, meshing the handle with the engine, you crank the handle over until the engine starts, when it does, this plunger will pop back out, disconnecting the handle from the engine, preventing the handle from ripping your arm off. Like we did with the driver's seat, let's take a moment to appreciate the lack of visibility given to the only guy on the tank with a machine gun. All you have up here to see out when you're buttoned up are the three vision slits in your cupola, or the two loopholes, one on either side of the turret. Other than that, you have to either poke your head out of the cupola, or the back hatch, both of which leave you incredibly vulnerable. Once again, not ideal. Oh. And that about concludes our tour. Overall, the M1917 was a great tank. It took the already fantastic Renault FT and improved upon it with better visibility for the driver, a gun shield to protect your armament's otherwise very vulnerable mount, and even a more powerful engine albeit by three horsepower. When compared to tanks even slightly newer than this, it most certainly shows its age, but for a design from the late 1910s, it stands the test of time surprisingly well. So with that, I hope you enjoyed this tour, and if so, please consider liking this video and even subscribing, as it really does help us out a lot. In the meantime, I'm Matthew with the American Heritage Museum. Thank you for watching.